So that's what I'm saying. The text is like an object. It's going to change perspective based on where you're standing. I don't know. Hello? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I missed you, baby sweet. It was a day. Hmm. It was a day. Please tell me you're seeing this too. From Seattle, we are drinking the movies. I'm Taylor Baker. And I'm Michael Clausen. Ooh, it's like we're on a tropical island. What type of beer are we drinking today, Michael? Today we're drinking the Fresh Tracks Tropical Hazy IPA from Hellbent Brewing Company. A little heavier than we normally do. This is a 6.5. We normally right. hang out around the 5.5 range or so. But it's caught your eye because I don't think we've had this before. That's right. And I mean, we're going to be talking about... You know, Howard Hawks, so we gotta gotta get a little bit more belligerent than usual. Get a little hazy for Hawks? Uh-huh. Uh, I can get down with that. I think I am getting down with it, because we have it here, and we are drinking it. Um, so, as always, we're doing some first impressions before we dig into our classic uh, three films from Howard Hawks. Why don't you tell the listeners what we're going to be digging into today before we dive into the first impressions. Today, we're digging into 1940's His Girl Friday. Then we'll chat about 1944's To Have and Have Not. And lastly, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes from 1953. And tell me, Michael, do gentlemen prefer blondes? I prefer brunettes. On to first impressions of a comic book film called Morbius, starring Jared Leto. And an overpowering urge to consume blood. we allowed to go to we'll fix something that's broken until the remedy <laughs> is worse than the disease all right michael that was the trailer for morbius starring jared leto supported by jared harris what do you think I'm not familiar with this property at all, so can't really speak to what it might be doing in terms of translating the original material. But, you know, it looks like more of a big budget comic book spectacle uh, with a character or with an actor that I don't particularly like. So, which is to say, this is not one I'm particularly excited for. Um... Uh, I like Jared Harris okay. So, um, looks like the support the supporting players might have something to offer, but um, you know, just in brief, not exactly my kind of thing. What about you? I also didn't think it was your type of thing. I don't think it's necessarily my type of thing, but um, I do like Jared Leto actually. I really enjoyed him in Dallas Buyers Club. I think that his performance in Mister Nobody actually deserves a lot more credit than it ever receives. Um, this is him doing the thing that he does in Blade Runner and in Mr. Nobody, which is put on a lab coat and act like he's smarter than Jared Leto is. And that's a fine role for him. It always has been. I have a feeling that this will be absolutely fine, which is actually kind of a victory for me as far as superhero movies go. When something's totally fine, that means that it's actually probably pretty good by comparison. Um... So I'm I'm pretty intrigued by it. Um, I imagine it'll get me into the door, and I have a feeling that um, I will relish with joy the murder scenes um, that seem to be a little bit more creative than normal. Uh, did Did you care particularly for the hallway disapparition and apparition effect? It looks like some of the action is pretty sleekly shot and choreographed. I think some yeah. of that looks kind of appealing. Um, it's it's just that if history is any indication, usually in this genre, that kind of action is is pretty uh, empty for me. You know, it, yeah. it's it's a pretty cheap thrill I get that I forget about pretty quickly. I mean, if I had to pick one this year to see, this would maybe be rising above some of the others, just kind of given the the look of it. Um, but uh, you know, the idea that it is perhaps fine relative to the other kinds of comic book movies we're getting is maybe not 
a high enough bar for me to get in the door with it, but we'll see. I see. Uh, right now we're <laughs> on recording on February 1st. It's early. Uh, we've begun to look forward to 2020. The movies we got last year are seemingly going to be better than the movies we get this year. I have an extremely low bar set, and this has achieved... <laughs> You'll take anything right now. <laughs> I, would, I sure will. I just sat through the rhythm section, Michael. All right, on to a different comic book movie starring um, Gal Gadot, directed by Patty Jenkins. This is Wonder Woman 84. We all have our struggles. Have you ever been in love? A long, long time ago. You? So many times. Yeah, all the time. <laughs> All right, we just watched the trailer for Patty Jenkins' Wonder Woman 1984. What do you think? That is the name of the movie, and I saw some spectacle. I didn't get any semblance of what the plot might be. Um, it ends with what is surely the final climactic act in which wonder woman has somehow achieved new armor and it's super dark and full of cg and i'm not the most excited about this movie i certainly had some high expectations between patty jenkins and chris pine uh how about you michael i'm actually more interested in this one versus morbius i think uh i like gal Gadot better um i like that it is a little lighter in tone. At the same time, I'm not terribly enthused about uh, 80s nostalgia, which I think the zeitgeist has kind of been, you know, itching for ever since Stranger Things. That just seems to be a uh, thing that continues that I'm not terribly psyched about. I liked the first Wonder Woman good enough. It's a very, very boring take to say I like the first two thirds of it because I think a lot of people feel that way before uh -huh. it gets dark and gloomy in that first third and it kind of looks like this might do the exact same thing it um, sure does which is my pushback yeah um i this is chris pine correct I this is chris pine which he is one of my uh preferred chris's if you so. remember he was killed in the first one right i, I do re recall that um which is no surprise in comic book movies that it doesn't mean anything anymore right um so, yeah, I don't know. Um, it will be a pure, purely a function of uh, time and convenience, whether or not I make it to the theater and whether or not I have taken advantage of my AMC that month. My AMC A-list, that is. What uh, about you? Yeah, I imagine I will go see this. I hope that the next trailers are a little bit more illuminating of what type of comedy I can expect to see from Kristen Wiig. Um, I, I like to see her here. I like to see her, but I didn't get anything from her. I didn't get anything from the storyline. Um, not a great trailer. No, yeah, Pretty that flashy. that might be my my pushback. Maybe Morbius had the better trailer and will be the worst movie. Maybe this mm. had the worst trailer and will be the better movie. Uh, that's probably what will come to pass. But um, based on just what I saw, I am actually more interested in seeing what Morbius is artistically than Wonder Woman eighty four right now. Um. But let's talk about some some classics. Let's talk about Howard Hawks's His Girl Friday. From the Columbia Studios in Hollywood comes an exciting new film triumph. A companion hit to Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, His Girl Friday. Co-starring a thrilling new pair of screen lovers, Devil May Care, Cary Grant, and ravishing Rosalind Russell. Let's listen in to one of their tender, idyllic love scenes. I am fond of you, you know. And a girl. I often wish you weren't such a stinker. A lot has changed since the 1940s, Michael. Newspapers are more reliable than ever. We trust them. Reporters are some of the most trustworthy individuals and modern day america and this film has just aged poorly hasn't it am i picking up on some sarcasm here oh just <laughs> the ever so slightest of bits we are moving chronologically through hawk so our first one his girl friday is from 1940 mm -hmm. um would you like to give the synopsis should i do that go ahead 
Uh, this stars Rosalind Russell and Cary Grant, as well as uh, Ralph Bellamy. Um, Rosalind Russell plays a highly skilled news reporter who, at the start of the film, is arriving at her paper's office to tell her former boss and ex-husband that she'll be quitting and is engaged to a new man uh, to whom marriage offers the opportunity to become a housewife and start a family. Uh, The boss is played by Cary Grant. Her new fiancé is Bellamy. And Grant uh, is does not respond well to this news and is eager to keep Hildy, Rosalind Russell's character, around. And uh, so ensues uh, hijinks in which um, Walter Burns Grant's character um, uses a big story unraveling to uh, excite Hildy and keep her around the paper's office uh uh-huh. that's a screwball comedy i absolutely loved it where are you at on this one i didn't really like the first third actually mm. um which is something that continues for me in to have and have not and only eluded me in uh gentlemen prefer blondes which is something i enjoyed throughout um so i i did really like especially how the film ends once it really drives up the screwball comedy and um, really starts playing with patter and dialogue um, exchanges. But that first third, it was very focused on establishing itself, building its characters, and was a little bit more lumbering to me. Mm. Um, I, I didn't feel the same patter that we get in the last third, in the first third at all. Mm. Um, and you know, once we're introduced to how nefarious Cary Grant is, I think is when the movie kind of unlocks itself. And that doesn't really happen until about 30 minutes into the film, I think. Yeah, it is a big wind up for sure. I could completely understand that though. There was plenty I liked in that first act that is sort yeah. of the big setup. It is kind of a long runway. And then, yeah, it's, it's only after, um, uh, the, the big story that's unraveling is that a man is to be executed. A white mm-hmm. guy who has shot a black man mm-hmm. and the paper thinks that the, uh, mayor is rushing the execution for political reasons. Um, and at one point there is a jailbreak. The, mm-hmm man who is to be executed breaks out and that's really where i think like that is the uh turning point where things suddenly pick up all right back in back in all right as we were saying before minor technical difficulties settled in uh i think i would agree that the good stuff is in the second half of this movie that is where the screwball really kicks into high gear the high speed dialogue really uh goes up a notch and yeah. yeah i love the the breathlessness of all that fast paced dialogue that's like part of the greatness of the movie um but uh yeah i mean i i thought there was great stuff in the beginning too i think there's just some important um characterization happening there and some of it's um uh kind of subtle um like Hildy walking into the office and like every other person saying, Hey, Hildy, welcome back. Hey, Hildy, how you doing? Just this sense of everyone being excited to see her back in the office. It just gives you a sense of her kind of stature in the newsroom. I just think there's some important characterization in that run up. Um, yeah, the disregard that she has for anything that Cary Grant says, mm -hmm. um, that gives us a hint of how truthful he might be later on and exactly how legitimate certain monies being exchanged might just be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One of the earlier funny scenes is, uh, Grant's character, Walter first coming out into that lobby and mistaking the older guy who's sitting there for Hildy's, uh, fiance, you know, Uh and they had, they start talking over each other, trying to, uh, explain who is who. I thought, I think that's kind of a funny, uh, set up just a little uh, appetizer for this screwball that is to come in the second half. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the good stuff is in uh, the second half. And I, I like that to me, it doesn't just feel fast for the sake of feeling fast. It is partly just about the thrill of work. This is giving us a sense of the rush she finds in work and how exhilarating it is. And that's why she is 
um, kind of instinctively drawn to it. And that is part of this push and pull between her, um, you know, hesitation to leave the workplace and, and maybe settle down while she also seems to very genuinely be interested in family life at the same time. That's why she broke up with Walter in the first place. Um, and why she's so excited to go honeymoon in Niagara. Yes, exactly. Uh, I really like Rosalind Russell. I like Cary Grant too, but I definitely think she is the star for me here. For sure. Um, and I think it's kind of more her story than Cary Grant's. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, I mean, this is probably one of the earlier or earliest films I've seen where um, a woman you know, is not only the star of the film, but her job defines the film and, yeah. and that type of stuff. So it, it definitely was kind of um, surprising as far as genre goes. I, I didn't quite know what I was getting into. I knew that Hawks had snappy dialogue, but when it started and it was kind of that slower patter, um, I, I really didn't know what I was watching. And um, by the end of the film, I, I honestly don't feel like they even feel like the same dialogue wise. The last 10 minutes and the first 10 minutes feel completely different because when it exits, the dialogue is going a million miles a minute. Like it is formula one dialogue racing. And the beginning is kind of this slower, um, more establishing, you know, classic exposition build. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think the dialogue itself is pretty witty. Mm -hmm. um, like one of my favorite details was on ha on multiple occasions, Hildy, Hildy will call Walter out for saying something that's not quite true. Like when he says, you know, oh, I swear on my mother's grave. And she says, your mother's dead. And he says, oh, don't get, you know, technical on me now, <laughs> which is exactly what a reporter should be doing mm -hmm. is distilling fact from fiction. And she whoa, catches on. Whoa, him. whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> no, they shouldn't. No, they shouldn't. <laughs> It's what I like to think they do. <laughs> no. And no. just another, it's it's better, more subtle evidence of how good she is at this thing. She can't mm -hmm. even help it. She She's always discerning fact from fiction. Yeah. Um, I, I like that detail. Um, and it never, it never exits the plot of the picture. Um, and it, it's fun to watch her be slowly spooled back in to Cary Grant. Um, you know, she starts at such odds with him and she's so excited for this new life. And then without any real prodding, she seems to um, choose essentially to stay and do the story so that her fiance can make some uh, some money off of a bonus for signing an insurance policy. Um, and that's kind of where you begin to see her take a, a full agency in the picture and, um, where the comedic, um, dialogue snap kind of really kicks in finally. Oh yeah. Yeah. On the note of her fiance, I feel like this is like the perfect example of the use of the threes, how he ends up in jail like three times. And that mm -hmm. third time is so satisfying. He's like, I'm in jail now for counterfeit money, if you can believe it. Uh, and then that's when, of course, she breaks down in tears, but like tears of joy because she realizes that uh, she thought Walter was kind of done playing this game, but he actually was still kind of playing after all. Uh -huh. um, and that's what she likes. She likes that she, he wants to keep her around. She He wants to keep her doing what he knows she does so well. It's just very satisfying stuff. It's a film about the art of seduction. <laughs> it is. Um. Yeah, uh, yeah, and making light of some of that dark stuff is funny. Like, there's, you know, the truly dark stuff, like a lady trying to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. um, but then subtler stuff, too, like when that jailbreak happens and bullets start flying and some come through the newsroom. And one of the guys is like, hey, watch where you're pointing that thing. Yep. It's not ever, you know, turning into a thriller. It's so light, even though people are literally shooting at each other. Or when the, uh, near the end, when the escaped convict locks himself into the desk. Great stuff. <laughs> that just loads those scenes with some suspense um, as people are going about the newsroom and he's in there. That was great. Um, her diving after the uh, sheriff who's trying to get away after bungling the uh, interrogation of the guy who's to be executed. Great scene. Um yeah, I, I I I love the performances, the the pace of it. I I just I went for it. Did you have a favorite scene? 
Um, it's hard because the second half kind of feels like one big scene, right? Mm-hmm. Um, one of my favorite moments. Well, I guess I like right when the jailbreak starts. It's just before the jailbreak that her fiance is thrown into jail for the first time. And she gets pissed. She calls up Walter and says, uh, screw it. I'm done. I've torn up what I'm, I'm, what I've already written. I'm out of here. The second that jailbreak happens, she sees what chaos is stirring, what this is going to become, immediately dives back into the typewriter, is right back into it. Can't help it. Um, I like just the, the drive, the instinctual drive to, to dive back in. It's pretty fun. Yeah. What about you? It's hard. It's actually not a picture that I think looks particularly good. Um, at any point, it's definitely more of a, uh, office drama before they really nailed lighting and before Jules Dassin kind of reinvented how to shoot in the city. Pretty pragmatic um, in its shooting. I, th- I think mine is pretty similar to yours. I don't remember the exact specifics, but I remember the look of her going and getting on the phone um, and ringing. Um, and this is one of the only scenes in the film that I remember where we kind of track movement from one room which is the office where I think everyone's uh, working into the side telephone room and behind her. You want to have another go at your favorite scene from His Girl Friday? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so my favorite scene is uh, just kind of a, a docile um, average scene. Um, but it is only one of the only scenes in which we see uh, a transfer through a room. Um, it's one Hildy. Um, goes from the main reporting room into the side telephone room. Um, there's a change of lighting. The windows behind her have a different, um, lighting signature than the, uh, lights in the office in front of her. And she makes a phone call. It's a pretty simple scene, but I just really enjoyed the lighting change. Um, and a film that's honestly kind of boring looking. Uh, that is one of the the few things that I enjoyed. On to our next Hawks feature. Ernest Hemingway, soldier of fortune, who can always be found where adventure beckons, now takes you to the danger zone of the Mid-Atlantic, where strange ships slip through the fog with even stranger cargoes, where every man has a price and every woman a past, where all barriers are down, and the only law is the law of the Caribbean. I understand you liked this film quite a bit, Michael. I did enjoy To Have and Have Not quite a bit. This one's from 1944. Uh, yes, I'm positive on it. Where are you at, at it, on it? I'm um, fairly similar to where I was with His Girl Friday. However, I, I liked the pace a little bit more here. Although it did lack the snappy dialogue, the first third was decidedly different than the other two thirds um once again i genuinely don't know what part of france we're in during this picture martinique i believe right yeah but like i have no idea where we're at i do um, but it, only because i looked it up because i did not know either okay yeah, so just in the caribbean essentially that's so, what yeah. i assumed and um the, the just the way that it it's presented um kind of opaquely but extremely specifically about something happening with the germans Mm -hmm. and exactly why they're fighting this war and whose side who is on and why exactly that is i think it kind of stumbled a little bit there but it it, yeah i think it was at its best with uh with slim and Mm -hmm. and just the the simple um vacation um you know falling in love and being kept away from each other that that basic chemistry i think worked a lot better than the um the subtleties of Mm. this screenplay that aren't quite so subtle but aren't quite specific and direct enough to work for me do you want to give the folks the brief summary you want me to do that part i think you could probably nail it a little bit better than i can i'm gonna go for it go for it this one's starring Humphrey Bogart, Lauren Bacall, Walter Brennan, 
which I believe was not only Bogart and Bacall's first time on screen, but I think this was also her screen debut. Which kind of blew my mind. To read really? That. I didn't realize that. Because she was quite confident on screen, so I would she not sure have is. guessed that by any means. Um, but yes, as you mentioned, sent in the French Caribbean, Bogart plays an American expat. He's working as a charter fishing boat captain. Uh-huh. When Not he, unlike Matthew McConaughey's Serenity. Oh, I, I had a feeling we were going to talk about that. <laughs> Very interesting connection there. Um, when he, uh, he, he is living in Martinique, which is um, sort of under the authority of like pro-German uh, French authorities. And he falls in love with a fellow American played by Bacall, uh-huh. which eventually leads to him taking... A job offered by uh, French resistance fighters um, for financial reasons. He takes Brought this up to mission. him by Frenchy. Frenchy, that's correct. <laughs> um, yeah, I I adored a great deal of this movie. I was kind of surprised by how noirish it felt. Um, just kind of knowing the the setting, I was expecting something a little more like war movie-ish just because of the the, the setting the mm-hmm. period um but many of these scenes where bogart and bacall are first uh coming on to each other in the hotel room that felt very noirish with light coming through the venetian blinds i think all that looks great mm-hmm. um i think their chemistry is just kind of unbeatable i love them together. it's undeniable it's pretty good yeah um yeah i mean bogart is kind of like a bogart always is um he feels like a noir character but um and he's in need of a shave most definitely and i think it's a good mix of the kind of romantic intrigue between them with some pretty suspenseful like wartime uh action in a way like i think the scene where he actually goes to complete this retrieval of the uh French resistance fighters is pretty suspenseful. I like that scene where they're uh, out on the water, th- sailing through the fog, and then stumbling into this patrol boat. I thought that was all pretty tight. I thought the pickup was pretty good. I did not feel the same suspense you felt during that patrol boat scene. Not so much. Saw it uh, coming or just didn't feel it? Both. Once they start shooting, and then there's return fire that you don't see, and then like in an instant film cut the light that they're using the floodlight to to locate uh bogart's ship is is damaged it just there's a lot that dates it in these action scenes i would say the same thing about that first initial shootout um when the waiter is lost um it's it's interesting and it's not bad but there's it's definitely dated um, in a in a way that um, Fuller's films w- weren't for me, um, which mm. is what I'm directly comparing these action scenes to mm. more than anything. Which I mean, Fuller was what 15 years later, um, so mm-hmm. you know it might not be a fair direct comparison, but that's that's where I'm at. Yeah, there is a yeah grittier authenticity to his for sure. This is a yeah. little more glamorized, I guess mm-hmm. for sure. I, I like uh, the drama parts of this film particularly, but once it leans into its action and tries to use the set pieces, um, it loses a little bit of its touch. Yeah. Um, I like Bacall a great deal. I was not expecting her to sing as much as she does. Agreed. I very much enjoyed listening to that husky croon. I thought those were all nice interludes. Um, what else? Uh additional thoughts um i i mean the the scenes with him playing the bullet doctor um mm. are actually pretty jovial and kind of comedic mm. um i like the jealousy that lauren bacall seems mm-hmm. to express whenever he's interacting with this man who's been shot's wife mm-hmm. um he carries her to a different room when she's passed out from um, 
some chloroform, it, 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 or at least it appears to be chloroform. And he hasn't put her down yet, and Lauren walks in and she says, what are you doing, Wayner? I was hoping you were going to mention that line. That is a good line. Yeah, there's just, there's there's those few lines that kind of define who Howard Hawks is for me. Um, and more than anything, it's his femme fatales that kind of, I I think I gravitate towards in his films. Now, whether or not they're always femme fatales might be debatable, but I, I do think that he tends to lean towards a um, scrupulous, um, kind of a noirish female character. Even in the film that we're going to get to, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, I think there is a little bit of um, not only mystique, but a little bit of illicit activity to Mm -hmm. each of these um, characters. Um, Even previously, Hildy in um, the film that we just discussed, I I think her... um, men that she's attracted to kind of bespeaks a, a little bit of a of a darker side of of the the feminine um character so i i think that there might be a pattern there where hawks's um most enjoyable female characters do have this darker side to them 100 percent, i do think he has a great deal of respect and kind of admiration for them mm-hmm. um i do like the the male friendship we get here between bogey and walter brennan's character who plays mm-hmm. the alcoholic uh crewmate he's not an alcoholic he just needs to drink all the time mm-hmm. potato potato <laughs> uh i thought he was both very funny but also uh a source of pathos i thought it walks that line nicely um especially because this movie partly feels about like loyalty in a way mm-hmm. um you know he's he's the hardened tough guy that you would expect bogey to be in this movie or in a noir movie but it's his soft spot that for his pal eddie that sh- sort of shows some sensitivity to him and then it's not until eddie's been captured by the uh you know authorities that he then decides he's finally had enough you know that is sort of his um vulnerability yeah 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 um i think that works pretty well for me i think that is that was a credible transition for me for him to have gone from having no interest in getting involved with this cause to deciding um a line has been crossed or at least he now knows what it feels like um, to to have that line crossed Yeah. yeah do you have a favorite scene here i do really like some of the scenes where bacall is um singing at the piano i could pick any one of those i mean also iconic right is the scene where she's talking about um or asking him if he knows how to whistle Mm -hmm. um but i like the action scene too so i'll go with the uh boating scene where they go to retrieve the uh uh french resistance members what about you mine is actually uh kind of a, a quick stream of scenes in which bacall brings a bottle to bogey and then um, they end up back in her room somehow. I don't remember exactly what happens there. And then he exits her room and leaves her with, I believe, money and the bottle. And then she brings the bottle back into his room. And it's just kind of this, it's when the snappiness, that Howard Hawks snappy um dialogue and character building really begins and there's just something about Bacall kind of slyly bringing this bottle back to him that I I just adored very satisfying I think if I were to go back through either our texts or maybe the slack at one point we had exchanged the SNL skit where they are uh caricature caricaturing the scene where she tries to whistle Mm -hmm. McKinnon plays that character Mm -hmm. that is a great scene if you have seen to have and have not or if you haven't please look up that scene because it's hilarious it is on to gentlemen prefer blondes (laughs) it was a great book greater is a broadway stage hit and even more gorgeous glittering and hilarious on the screen with marilyn monroe as lorelei lee the world's most fabulous gold digging blonde I just love finding new places to wear diamonds. And Jane Russell is Dorothy Shaw, the world's most talked about brunette. Mr. Esmond and I are going to be married. To each other? Of course to each other. Who else to? 
Well, I don't know about you, Gus. I always sort of figured Lorelei would end up with the Secretary of the Treasury. My little angel, you don't even know there's a certain kind of girl would take advantage of a situation of this sort. Well, may I, uh, may I kiss your hand? I always say a kiss on the hand feels very good, but a diamond tiara lasts forever. Bye-bye, baby. Remember you're my baby when they give you the eyes. Third and final Hawks feature of the day is from 1953. I understand you are fond of this one. This is by far my favorite. This is one of my just all-time classic favorite films that I've ever seen. I love a good song and a dance. This starts with a good song and a dance. It has a good song and a dance in the middle, and it ends with a good song and a dance. I adore it. There's nothing quite like Marilyn being confused at the prospect of putting this necklace onto your head. Why would you do that? Oh, it's a tiara, dear. Um, So much comedy. I adore it. I'm right there with you. It's buoyant. It's light. It is a great deal of fun. I like both actresses, Marilyn Monroe and Dorothy Shaw, I want to say. That sounds right. I was less... Excuse me. That's the character's name. name yes. Jane Russell. Also I, I was less uh, enamored with Jane than I was Marilyn, she as was the film. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, there's really not a weak number here. No. Um, I think I preferred... Bye Bye Baby, when they are getting ready to depart. And then uh, Jane Russell's number with the uh, Olympic team. Mm-hmm. Also that, enjoyed that That was pretty deal. killer, yeah. Do you have numbers that stood out? I think, honestly, the the closing number... Um, or not to pick that. Is, it, it ends, so that's that's part of the reason why it sticks in my head. But I was smiling... And just kind of my whole body was kind of enjoying it, Um, which is to me what this film is all about. Like, I just had such a pleasant, good time watching the entire film. And anytime Marilyn was acting, we'll say uh, innocent or daft, um, it was just hilarious. But the, the great thing that's happening underneath that is a really, really, really meticulous performance from her whenever she's exchanging dialogue or interacting with other characters. I don't know if you noticed quite so much as I did um, or, or how good the copy of your version of this film was. I know that we kind of exchanged recommendations about which print to watch for certain films did you end up watching a, a good print of this film, or did you watch something a little bit more lackluster? This one was good. This was I I rented this one from iTunes, and that was a very crisp um, version. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. So did did you see kind of the um, the ma- more meticulous reaction shots that that Marilyn was doing with her face? Did did you notice those at all? Uh, yeah. I mean, I definitely responded to her performance overall. No doubt. Okay. Because I I think um, comparatively with To Have and Have Not, um, th- this was, and His Girl Friday, there was more expressiveness and, and more just facial cue acting um, happening here than, than in the other two films. Um, that might also just be the difference of camera and lens um, and budget and all, all that good sort of stuff. But I, I definitely got a lot out of Marilyn's performance here, not just the song and the dance numbers, but when she's having these conversations and then reacting to information that she doesn't quite know what to do with because her character is so blonde. Yes. Uh, yeah. Very much a play on this blonde bimbo archetype, mm-hmm. but it's never cruel. Like it's quite no. the opposite. It's very ironic and kind of playing with that, these notions of superficiality, um, which she almost says, uh, as much um it's towards the end right i think she's talking to her husband's father mm-hmm. right talking about yes. um i wish i could remember i should have had that are, are you talking bed. about the scene where um she brings up how if you had a daughter you would want exactly. her to marry into wealth so why shouldn't i want to do that i don't want to marry him for his wealth i want to marry him for your wealth exactly and these men are interested in her for her looks mm-hmm. she's interested in them for her money that seems even Stevens to me. Um, yeah, I, I do think it is very 
uh, sly in that way, um, while always being a great deal of fun. Yes, it's endearing, we'll say. 100%. Um, boy, do you have a favorite supporting character? Uh, the little boy was better than I thought he would be. I did he think was he was funny. Good. Um, I don't know. How do you not go with Piggy, though? Were you going to say Piggy? No, I was going to say Piggy's wife. Oh, Piggy's wife. Good she pick. She's pretty amazing. Um, and her, her dourness at putting up with Piggy. Um, mm-hmm. is quite enjoyable. What do you think the chances are Piggy's diamonds are blood diamonds? I think, I he is. think that they're... <laughs> there's no way they're legit. not based on the information we gather about Piggy and where his flight that he doesn't have is going to. Yeah, I kept thinking decades later, this New York sleazy jeweler will solicit a black opal from one of his mines, most likely. <laughs> mm, perhaps... Perhaps some sort of an, a black opal that's uncut, like an uncut gem. That sounds plausible. Yes, yes. Yeah, Maybe like a descendant Piggy. of his will be Jewish and getting a colonoscopy. There's something there. I'm telling <laughs> you. He was good. I didn't think most of the cast is pretty strong, but yeah, I mean, the numbers are pretty hard to beat. They're all catchy. They're all upbeat. They're all a lot of fun. It's hard not to say that over and over. Favorite scene then? Bye bye baby. Just that the whole was the catchiest thing, huh? for me. Um, yeah, favorite number, favorite scene. What about you? I think it might be the initial um, scene behind the stage when um, Daddy comes to see Marilyn and um, just kind of the the jovial back and forth that they have in front of um, Jane Russell. Um, and, and her, you know, reaction shots to her, her exasperation and reaction shots to this and, um, the fact that they're going to be going to France together without him, just that the way that that whole thing plays out, I, I really enjoyed. Um, so we've now done Howard Hawks and Sam Fuller. Who do you prefer so far i'll be checking in with you once a month as we work Holy through smokes. all these classic directors but who's your favorite classic director so far michael i would probably go with howard hawks this is a very tough decision i think they have very different sensibilities um i think my preference might be howard hawks so far what about you sam fuller yeah other than gentlemen prefer blondes i didn't particularly love anything the way that i loved the um the Naked Kiss mm-hmm. and The Steel Helmet. Um, both of those films just gave me so much gumption and energy and genre defining um, kind of work. Like they, they each have a very unique thumbprint that feels wholly a- auteurish in a way that Howard Hawks doesn't quite. He kind of feels more um, of a brand than a director to me, um, sensibility wise. So I, I think I got to go with Sam Fuller. Yeah. Truth be told, uh, they just, they, they scratch different itches for me. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, starting out strong, having to pick between those two. And finally, your favorite Hawks film out of all three. I would probably go with His Girl Friday. What about you? You know the answer. I it's think I do. Gentlemen prefer blondes. <laughs> there was no surprise there. We have to go. I'm coming with you. That was brilliant. You're the best and we love you! And that's another one in the can. We did it. Copped on. Two computer crashes. Still dead. (laughs) Can't be stopped.